Hello. I hope everybody can hear and see me. Uh, my name is Tamo Nakahara. I'm your DX community leader here at Weaveworks. And welcome to one of our next meetings for the Weave user group, which we kicked off now exactly. This is our one month anniversary. We kicked it off on Valentine's Day. And uh, we meet on the second and fourth Tuesdays of every month. So thanks to all of you people who are joining. It's great to see such a, a large crowd here. So today, we have um, such a treat. We have Sandeep Dinesh from Google, who is our guest speaker. And Sandeep, if you want to turn on your um, video and mic, you can get you going. Hey. And, hey. and um, he will be talking about scalable microservices with gRPC, Kubernetes, and Docker. And he's a great expert coming from the um, developer relations team. But I will also let him um, introduce himself further next. Hopefully, everybody can see the slides. Um, I will be going to the next slide to do some overview. Um, so Sandeep will be talking for the first half of this um, user group meeting. And then with time permitting, um, based on, you know, we want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. But we also have Tom Wilkie here from Weaveworks, who's the director of engineering. And he's actually going to talk about our own use case um, of gRPC. And um, so you have this great context where um, Sandeep will be talking about the topics, and then we'll actually share our own stories of how we migrated. I'm Sandeep. I'm a developer advocate at Google. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at my first name, last name. Um, and today I'm kind of excited to wake up early on Pacific time, 10 o'clock early for engineers, right? And talk about uh, gRPC, containers, Kubernetes, and more. And so this talk has evolved over almost a year now. And it's, it's, gets, it's pretty fun to do every single time. So let's just get right into it. Normally, I would ask, you know, who's heard of gRPC? Who's heard of Docker? Who's heard of Kubernetes? But there's no audience here. So I'm just going to assume that most people here are interested in learning about this stuff. Uh, and most people here are interested in learning about microservices. And so microservices have gotten super popular uh, over the last few years. A lot of people say it's just a rehashing of SOA, things like that. Um, but you know, if you look at Google Trends data, uh, microservices have gotten more and more popular uh, as the months go by. I need to update this for 2017. I'm assuming it's going to be even higher, uh, and for good reasons. If you don't know what a microservice is, it's basically taking the Unix philosophy and bringing it to your application. So you, know, you write a program that does one thing and does it well, and that works well with other programs. So instead of writing a really big, uh, application that does all the functionality of your application, you instead break that down into small functional blocks, and then these blocks talk to each other. And so it makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons, right? There's so many reasons why you'd want to go to a microservices stack. Um, things like continuous deployment and decentralization, scalability, um, every team can own their own service, things like that. There's a lot of pros, but there's also some cons. I mean, it's very difficult to manage and deploy a microservices stack, unlike a traditional monolithic stack where you have one application, you deploy it to production, and everything just works. Uh, you can run all your tests and stuff in one place. With microservices, all of a sudden, you have so many moving parts that it becomes very difficult to really manage the teams, manage the infrastructure, and manage the services. So in this talk, I'm going to give somewhat of a quick overview on how you can do microservices. One way that I think works really well for a lot of people. And that way is to use these two technologies, Kubernetes and gRPC. So Kubernetes is basically, uh, you can think of it as the third generation of an internal system at Google called Borg. So at Google, we basically run everything in containers. And because we have so many of them, we needed a system to manage this fleet, right? So Borg is a system that's designed to manage containers at Google. Now, we couldn't really just take that and put it on GitHub and say it's open source. It would just look really weird because it's tied into a lot of weird Google internal stuff. So instead, uh, three people from Google, Brendan, Joe, Craig, they open source Kubernetes as a from scratch re-implementation, taking all the lessons learned from Borg um, and open sourcing it into the world. And so that's what came out as Kubernetes, and now there's thousands and thousands of people who contribute to it um, on the open source project. And then we have the second part, which is gRPC. 
And so gRPC is a little bit newer and a little bit uh, less well known. And it's the open sourcing of a system internally called Stubby. And now it's very much, very much like Stubby internally, except it's using a lot more newer technologies like Protobuf version 3 and things like that that I'll get into in a second. So first, let's talk about Kubernetes. Um, at this point, I think most people have heard of what Kubernetes is. If not, hopefully you've heard at least of what Docker is. So Kubernetes, you can think of it as a system for orchestrating and managing containers in a cluster. And at the end of the day, that's really all it is. So typically what you'd have is you'd have an application, right? Maybe it's a Node.js app, maybe Python, Go, who knows? It runs fine on your local machine, but now you want it to ship it to production. Along came uh, this cool, cool new technology called Docker a few years ago, um, and it lets you build containers really easily. Containers have been a lot around for a really long time, um, but Docker really revolutionized the whole industry by making it super easy to use. So with something like Docker, you take your app and you put it into a container, and now it just becomes this green box. And so you can put this green box wherever you want. You can run on your server, it can run on your laptop, you can give it to your friend, it'll run on their laptop. The nice thing is you package all of the application's dependencies into this little green box, and you're good to go. You're not dependent on the host operating system um, anymore. And so what Kubernetes does is it takes that green box and it lets you deploy it. And it does it with something called a replication controller or a deployment. And these are really cool. So you don't have to actually log into your machines and say, run this container. Instead, you tell the Kubernetes API, hey, I want four copies of this container running in my cluster. And so the cool thing here is you're not actually managing where those containers are running manually. You're not uh, SSHing into machines and running commands. You're just telling the Kubernetes um, API, I want to run this container, make four copies of it, go. And so what you can do is you can scale up and down uh, as much as you want by just talking to the Kubernetes API and saying, I want four, I want 10, I want one. Um, and all the things that you want to do can be done with this API. But of course, if you have a arbitrary number of, ooh, getting a phone call. <laughs> If you're getting an arbitrary number of um, here we go. If you're getting an arbitrary number of services in your cluster, you have to have a stable way of actually addressing them. And so this is where services come in. And so a service is a stable endpoint and load balancer that will send traffic to these containers running in your cluster. And you take all of that and you put it into a package, and that's kind of what becomes a microservice. So you have that stable endpoint that can be used to find your service, do service discovery, uh, load balance traffic to your pods that are running in the back end, these containers. And so you put all that together, get your microservice. And the really cool thing with Kubernetes is that's basically it. With these two uh, service and controller concept, you can do most of what you need to do. And of course, it goes a lot deeper than that, of course, but for the basics, that's all you need. And with that, you can basically take these building blocks and make your microservices out of it. So for example, let's say you have four of these microservices running in your cluster. You can scale one up without affecting the others or causing downtime or anything like that. You can scale one down without affecting the others again. You can actually roll one up and roll it back. So you can update and roll back again without affecting the others too much. And this is actually really important that you can roll back because rolling up, if you break something, you always have to go back. Um, and of course, you build the Microsoft Office logo, which is the goal of software engineering. Um, but that's enough of me talking about Kubernetes. Let's actually build something. So there we go. Here I have my application. It's a very complicated app. Um, you know, it took like 10 hours to make this. It says, hello world, it's a, and it listens on port 3000. Um, this is basically the first thing that you do when you test something out. And so with Kubernetes, what we want to do first is actually build that Docker container. So here, I'm going to run the Docker build command, um, and I'm going to tag it with this special tag. And so gcr.io is Google Container Registry. You can use Docker Hub or Quay.io or any sort of private container registry you want. And what this will do is it'll actually build this container and then push it into the container registry. 
And once it's in the container registry, it can be securely accessed from our Kubernetes cluster, from somewhere else, things like that, right? We got to get it off our local machine onto some sort of central repository. And now the first thing we want to do is create this front end service. So this is actually all the code you need in our YAML file to create that stable endpoint to load balance traffic to our containers. And so I've highlighted some interesting things in red. So first of all, the port, I'm going to map port 80 to port 3000. You may have noticed that our server was listening on port 3000, but normally HTTP services listen on port 80. So I'm going to use the service to automatically forward all traffic from port 80 to port 3000. And then I'm going to use the selector thing, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And I'm going to say select all the backend pods with the name front end. And finally, I'm going to open up a type load balancer. And so this will actually open a cloud load balancer. If you're running on AWS, it'll open an um, a ELB. If you're running on Google Cloud, it'll open a network load balancer. And it's automatic. And that will give you a single IP address that will send traffic from the public internet into your cluster. So to actually deploy this, all we have to run is kubectl apply frontend service.yaml. And so I'm going to run that. Sorry, Sandy. Do you mind yeah. um, making your font a little bit bigger? Yeah, no problem. Thank you. So at this point, I can go kubectl get service. And so kubectl is the command line tool uh, for Kubernetes. And you can see that we basically deployed our front-end service. I did this uh, some time ago just so I can get this done faster. But um, you get a cluster IP. And because we did this type load balancer, you also get an external IP address. Now, if I visit this external IP, nothing will show up. And that's because we don't actually have any backing containers. So it's actually sending that traffic to nowhere. So we can actually see how many containers we have running by running kubectl get pods. And you can see there's no resources found. So we actually have no containers running in our system. So let's fix that. So here's our front end deployment. And again, I highlighted some important things in red. But that's all you really need to deploy a container into a Kubernetes cluster. So what I'm going to do is open up port 3000 on this whoop, whoop, port 3000 on this container, because that's where our server is listening then I'm going to give it the label name front end. So you might have noticed that in our service YAML, we were selecting all the pods with the name front end. And so now I'm going to give this one name front end. So we know this is what the service should point traffic to. Then I'm going to say I want two replicas, because why not? You can make an, any sort of arbitrary value to serve how much traffic you need. And finally, I'm going to give it the, the image name. So this is actually where we pushed our container up into. So gcr.io and then whatever project ID, front end, tag version 1.0. So again, just to do the same thing, we can run kubectl apply and put a front end. And so the deployment has been created. So if I do a kubectl get pods now, you can see that we have two of these containers running. And if I do get deployment, you can see our front end deployment is up and running. We have two desired uh, and then two available. So we're good to go. So now if we actually visit this IP address, we'll be able to see the service running. So let's do that really fast. Here we go. Hello world. Yay. Awesome. And we can keep going with the presentation. So let's get that video. So now we've basically deployed a container into our cluster, right? Um, we can scale it up and down. We can uh, update it and things like that. But the second part about microservices is really communication. Let's say we go back to our old picture um, of our four microservices in our stack. If in the past, these arrows could have just been function calls, right? Uh, maybe you had like object-oriented programming, so each of these was uh, a different class, and you were just calling uh, functions in or methods in those classes. But now, every time you want to, microservice B wants to communicate with microservice C, it has to go over the network, which has a lot of overhead associated with it. 
And so, you know, really, I think one of the biggest challenges in changing a monolith into a microservice is changing the communication pattern. It's not just about using a certain technology. It's also about changing the pattern of when you go over the network, when you actually, where you actually break your services up, right? You don't want to break something up that doesn't need to be broken up. If one service is only used by um, another service, maybe it makes sense to bundle those together. It really, it's up to you to, to really figure out where to break your stack into different pieces, depending on your organizational structure, depending on your code and everything like that. But in any case, gRPC is a technology that really makes that communication between microservices a lot more efficient and a lot more um, useful. Um, and so the big reason why Google developed something like gRPC is because our internal stack depends very heavily on RPCs. And so there's something like big O of 10 to the 10th, which is a lot of zeros, uh, RPCs per second at Google. Um, that number has probably only gotten up since I've pulled these stats. But um, that's a lot of network requests going over our data centers. And so it became really important to really optimize that and really make sure we understood how it was working. So that's where something like gRPC comes in. And so gRPC is actually, in my opinion, a framework that contains a lot of different things together. The first is protocol buffers, um, namely protocol buffers v3, which is the latest open source version. And so this is what a protobuf definition kind of looks like. It's a IDL, so you kind of describe this API and you can generate interfaces for any language from it. And this is basically the data model of the API. So you can see that we have something like a hello request and a hello response, and then we have a hello service, which is a, you know, it takes in a hello request and it returns a hello response. And so from this, you can structure the response and requests. And the nice thing with protobuf is it actually compiles these messages down into a small binary format, which is perfect for network transmission. So you're not really using plain text, you're actually compiling it down into a very efficient binary format. And so speaking of binary formats, the next part of gRPC is HTTP2. And so if I had to say one thing about HTTP1 and HTTP2, that one thing would definitely be speed. Um, HTTP2 is really built to make HTTP communications just a lot faster and a lot more parallelizable. And so you can try this out yourself at http2demo.com or .io uh, if you don't believe me, but it's pretty fast um, compared to HTTP1 for a variety of reasons. And so some of those reasons are multiplexing. So with multiplexing, you actually open up a single TCP connection for all your requests and you channel it through. So with H1, HTTP 1, you might have opened up multiple HTTP requests to do multiplexing, which has that additional TCP overhead. With HTTP 2, you're only using one single TCP connection. But my favorite part about HTTP 2 is definitely bidirectional streaming. And we'll show a demo of that really soon. So with bidirectional streaming, there's no more polling or sockets or uh, server, sent to, server sent events or anything like that. It's built straight into the protocol, into HTTP 2. So gRPC actually leverages this for doing um, streaming and bidirectional streaming. And finally, there's flow control built straight into the protocol. So you can control your congestion and make sure that your uh, services are not getting overwhelmed with requests and your front end services are not getting uh, stuff pushed to them too quickly as well. And finally, um, what would we be without multiple language support? Uh, gRPC supports a ton of different languages out of the box, basically the same languages that Protobuf supports. Um, so this includes things like Python, C++, C Sharp, Objective-C, uh, Java, Node.js, Ruby, PHP, Go, uh, the list goes on. I even saw a Swift um, client in the gRPC uh, repos recently, which is really cool. So you can see it works, you know, with both mobile and um, server technologies. So a lot of people are actually using gRPC in Android and iOS apps because it's just more more efficient network is great for mobile apps. Um, if you're doing something like a REST API today and you want like a real time streaming uh, API, gRPC might be a great um, fit. So it works great on mobile. It works great on the server, and it also works great for IoT. Um, so me and my coworker, Mark, we built this thing called Simon Says, and it's all open source, and you can check it out. Um, we took an off-the-shelf uh, Simon 
thing. And if you ever played this game, it's basically a memory game where a color will light up and you have to remember, and then more colors will light up and you have to remember the pattern until you lose. You can only lose, you can't really win. Um, so, because the computers can never forget, right? So it's a fun little game that you can play by yourself, but we were thinking, what if we make it multiplayer? And what if we make it connected to the internet? Because everything deserves to be connected to the internet. <laughs> um, so what we did is we actually built a system to connect Simon Says to the internet. And so I built a little IoT version of this that actually ran a physical box using Node.js. Um, my coworker Mark built a server in Go and a client, an Android client in Java. And so we're actually using gRPC to communicate between these three different platforms in real time. And so here's how it looked. Uh, we had a service called Simon Says. It uh, has a single RPC, a single method called game. It takes in a stream of requests, and it returns a stream of responses. Now, a request is simply a player, um, and it's a, it has a message called player. It takes one of a player or a color. And so a color is just red, green, yellow, blue, and a player is just a string with its ID. So it can either send a player or a color. And then the response will send one of a state or a color. And so a state, it just began start, turn, stop, turn, win, lose. Um, and colors are just, again, red, green, yellow, or blue. Um, looks kind of complicated, but it's really simple. And an uh, example will show how that is. So you can see that first thing that someone does when they start up the game is they request to join. So this is the player ID that's being sent to the server. And now the other person will uh, request to join with a different ID. Once the server has two people connected to it, it'll send that begin uh, response to both clients. And then it'll say, you join first, so it's your turn first, no JS. Uh, you join second, so it's not your turn, stop your turn. So now uh, the person who's playing on the Node.js client can press yellow, and then it'll send a light up to both to light up the color yellow. So it's actually doing a full round trip before the color is being lit up. And now the turn is over, so it's going to say stop turn to Node.js and start turn to the Java client. And now whoever's playing on Android is just really bad, and they hit red. And so now it's going to send a light up signal red to both, and it's going to say you lose because you're supposed to hit yellow, and you win. Um, and that's it. So before that, let's do a quick demo of this. So what I'm going to do is run, because I don't, can't really show off the IoT thing on my camera too easily. What I'm going to do is actually run it on my phone, and hopefully you can see it on my webcam. So I've connected on my phone, and now I'm going to connect on my client as well. So. What I'm going to do is actually run this here. I actually have a little web version that I'm running. And so now this is very difficult. But what I'm going to do is hit a color. And you can see almost instantly when I hit it on my phone, it shows up on the web version. So I'm going to say blue, green. Oh, wow. I hit green instead of blue. I probably should try it one more time just for fun. So let's run that. Cool. So I'm going to click here and I'll refresh this. So I'm going to say yellow. So it's the other player's turn. So I'm going to say yellow, green, or yellow, blue, yellow, blue, green, uh, yellow, blue, green, green. And now let's just lose. So I say yellow, blue, red, right? And I lost. And you can see with gRPC, that communication is almost instantaneous. The cool thing here is it's actually streaming from the server uh, to the client, uh, to two different clients, and doing that in real time. And so our server is actually running in a remote data center. So it's doing a full round trip from the server all the way back before we even see those colors light up. So let's upgrade our app to use gRPC. And so you can see here, what I'm going to do is have this very simple service called a geo service. And what it's going to do is take two points, uh, two coordinates, and then return the distance between those using the Haversign formula. So you can see I'm going to use a message point, and it's basically two floats. And then point is a origin and a destination, and it's of type point. So you can actually use different um, types you've defined in your profile in other definitions as well, which is really cool. And then our distance is just a float. So it's going to take up some points and return a distance. 
And so what we're going to do is have a back-end service and a front-end service. So in our back-end code, we're going to require the gRPC uh, library. I'm using Node.js here. And so we're going to build this using the gRPC build server. You can also compile your protos into stubs, which is the way that's recommended. And so what we're going to do is just basically whenever we're going to call the service, we're going to call um, the get distance formula here. And so distance between is going to take that and call back this get distance formula with the call dot request. All get distance is going to do is run the Haversine formula on these, um, on these latitude and longitudes and return the distance. And then we're going to bind it to port 551 and start listening. And so 551 or 50,051, as someone has corrected me, um, because it's not 551, <laughs> is uh, the gRPC port. So now we're going to build this container the exact same way that we built the previous one and deploy it. And so the front end is now being upgraded as well. We're actually going to load that exact same proto file and then connect to backend colon 551. And so this is where Kubernetes really comes into play. Um, you can see that I can just use the, the DNS name backend to connect to our backend service. You don't actually have to specify IP addresses or do any sort of special load balancing or anything like that. I can just say connect to the backend um, and using DNS, Kubernetes will automatically resolve that to the correct IP addresses for me, which is really nice. I don't have to worry about service discovery at all. And so here I can send in some, a request that looks something like this. Um, I can stringify that and send it into my backend service using the distance between function. And so we'll get that response out and then print it onto the screen. And again, we build the front end container. This time we tag it 2.0 and push it to our container registry. And now for the actual deployment. So this looks very similar to our front end deployment. The only real difference is we're using the back end container and we're opening up port 551. And instead of name front end, it's going to be called name back end. So let's actually deploy that into our cluster. So I'm going to say cube CTL by There we go. And so now if I run um, kubectl get pods, you can see that we have four backend containers running, and then we have uh, two of our front-end containers. But of course, our front-end containers are still running our older service. So let's actually deploy the backend service first. So this will do the load balancing and service discovery for um, our backend services. We have four of these pods. We want one stable endpoint. This will do that. So once we do this, we can say cube CTO apply backend service. And now when we do a get service, we can see that we have our backend service created. Um, and it only has a cluster IP. There is no external IP address because it's an internal service to our cluster. We don't want external people accessing this. So you can only access it if you're inside the cluster. Um, and this is our cluster IP, and our, D our DNS name is backend, which is nice. Cool. So now we're going to actually update the front end. So I can actually run this cool command called kubectl edit deployment front end. And it'll pull up the YAML of the currently running front end service. And what I can do is I can go in here and actually just change the image tag to 2.0. And so typically, I would write my, another YAML and do it manually. But I can also do this, and it will edit the front end. And now if I do a get pods, you can see it's actually terminating the old ones and already running the new ones. And so the cool thing here is it'll do a rolling update and remove the old pods from our cluster and put in the new containers uh, to replace them. And you do this with zero downtime. You can do this with blue-green deployments. You can do things like that, um, which get a little bit more complicated. But that's all I needed to do to update my code to the running to the new version. And so now if we go to that IP address here, instead of hello world, we'll actually see um, the new service up and running. Unfortunately, I have some bit rot in my code. I'm using very old versions of Node.js, so I'm just going to play the video. I'm going to cheat a little bit. <laughs> so here I have, um, this is what will happen if we hit update. Um, so here I'm actually rolling that up. And then if I hit refresh, it'll go and put the new distance. Believe me, it works. <laughs> I just need to update my code a little bit. So uh, just 
in conclusion, you know, if you want to learn more about these two things, they're both open source. Uh, they run on-prem, they run multiple cloud environments. Um, a lot of people are using them in production today. Uh, you can learn more about Kubernetes at k8.io and more about gRPC at gRPC.io. Um, of course, I work for Google Cloud, and so I would be remiss not to tell you that we have a hosted Kubernetes. Um, it's where I was running all my demos today. Um, it's called Google Container Engine. Basically, it runs the open source Kubernetes platform, but instead of having to set up the cluster yourself, uh, you just click a button and you get a cluster built for you. So you can just connect to it and start using it today. And if you want to learn more about all the things I talked about, um, here are some links. I can put them, um, I can share them with the group. Uh, the Simon code is on what I think the most best code to look at. The sample code here is a little bit rusty, like I said, but our, um, our Simon Says code is really up to date. It has multiple clients in Java, in um, Node.js, and things like that. So you can look at it in different languages and see how it's. And so if you want to also join us on Slack, um, if you want to talk more about Kubernetes or gRPC, we have a Google Cloud Slack, um, which is really active, and I'd love to talk to you there. Or you can just hit me up on Twitter. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Sandy. That was great. Um, so I know uh, I forgot to mention in the beginning that um, you prefer to have questions in the end. So I've been um, yep. sort of monitoring. We had a very early question um, by Falguni, so I'm not sure what the context is at this point. Um, but he was asking, why not containers? So um, if you want to um, sure. sort of give more uh, uh, clarification on your question, go ahead. But or if Sandy, if you feel I, so, so Kubernetes uses containers. Um, I think. The big, something that confuses a lot of people with Kubernetes is the version of a pod versus a container. And I kind of went over that a little bit too quickly. So a pod is basically a group of one or more containers. And for most people, it's usually just one container. Um, the really cool thing about a pod is you can put multiple containers together into like a group. And so why you want to do this is you'd have something like a, a helper container that does some sort of configuration or maybe a logging container or something like that. And so it really makes sense to tie these together, and they share local host, and they do a few things like that. And they're always scheduled together and things like that. So maybe you have a container that does logging, and you want to use that container in multiple pods, right? So you have your front end, you have your web service, you have your user service, and they all have to do logging. Instead of baking that logging into um, each of your applications, you can just make a pod with your main container and then your logging container and put it together. So um, Kubernetes uses this concept of a pod as its uh, atomic scheduling unit. For the most part, it's just equivalent to a container. Yeah. And I'm seeing some more questions. Yes, there was one from Ra. Uh, sorry. Um, um, curious running, where are you running these services? Do you have VMs set up already, or do you keep doing that on the fly? So yeah, I'm actually using uh, Google Container Engine, and so I've set up a cluster uh, right before. Um, to create your own cluster, it just takes a little longer, maybe like one or two minutes. Uh, you just run G Cloud container clusters create, and then you just hit enter, and it'll create a cluster for you. Um, by default, I'm running a three node cluster um, with our N1 standard ones, but you can make them as big or small as you want. You can run this, you know, on your laptop if you wanted to. Great. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we have one um, from Walid. Is the JRPC with JS and front end running inside Google? Yes, it is running in Google Cloud, which is technically running inside Google. Um, I'm not 100% sure what that question really means, but uh, yes, it is running in one of our data centers. Uh, and you can try that yourself, too. <laughs> can you deploy a database to Kubernetes? Yes, you can. I actually have a really cool blog post about this using a little bit, something a little bit more complicated called stateful sets. Um, now, with a replication controller like I showed, there's absolutely no state. Uh, these containers live and die, and all the state is just destroyed when the container um, restarts. So if you want to deploy a database, you have to do a little bit more work. And I have a really cool blog post. Um, I can just paste it in right here. I just search MongoDB on Kubernetes. Here we go. I'll just paste it into here. Boom. And so you can do this. Uh, I, this is some, someone made a really good um, uh, example with using Postgres as well. It has things like replication and backups and all these kind of real, a lot of different services to really run a self-hosted Postgres in Kubernetes. Um, and I think you know, when you're running a database in containers or Kubernetes, it's just as complicated uh, as running it without containers, right? You have all those requirements you have to do. I actually think it's a little bit easier to run in containers, um, but you still have to think about a lot of things. So running a database is hard. <laughs> just remember that. <laughs> 
Cool. Cool. Um, oh, one more. So Objective-C and not Swift. So Objective-C is supported. I saw a new repo with a native Swift support as well. So it's marked as experimental. Yep. Um, so yeah, experimental is experimental. <laughs> cool. Give people just 10 more seconds if you have any last questions. Can you use gRPC in the browser? Kind of, sort of. Um, the, the, this example I had was using a WebSockets bridge. Um, and so we have a RESTful bridge right now, and I think WebSocket support is coming soon. There are some, still some issues with using native HTTP2 uh, objects like that with the, um, with the browser. I think basically the browsers don't have support for the APIs that are required um, to do gRPC natively yet. Firefox and Chrome and all these things are working on it, so hopefully we'll have it soon. Awesome. And with that, in fact, one of our questions was, you know, I'd love to hear a use case for it. And we are very well prepared because we have Tom from our own team here at Weaveworks, a director of engineering. He can add more uh, flavor to that uh, intro if he likes. Um, but we have our own use case, and, and Tom has been in the middle of it, so he will share that. So, Sandeep, you are welcome to lead if you like, or if you'd like to um, turn off your camera and your mic and just listen in. Maybe you even have questions for Tom on how we did it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you again, Sandeep. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Sandeep. I really enjoyed that. Um, I like your demo. That's one of the best uh, little microservices demo I've seen. Um, OK, hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, let me know if anyone can't. Let's get some slides. Here we go. So gRPC at Weaveworks. Um, this is, uh, oh, I'll introduce myself first. So I'm director of software engineering at Weaveworks. Um, that really means I'm just a software engineer. We're a small startup. Uh, I also brew my own beer. Uh, I don't know why I included that. I thought it would be nice to know. Uh, I used to previously. I, I used to work at Google. I was uh, on the SRE team for Google Analytics, and uh, before that, I had my own startup. Um, and previous and before that, Zensource. Uh, if you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, um, please feel free. Or if you want to check out my code, which is probably more relevant, it's on my GitHub. Um, so, what do what does WeaveWorks do, and what what am I here to talk about? Well, we have this thing called Weave Cloud, which is at cloud.weave.works. Uh, and this is our system for exploring and deploying and monitoring microservice-based architectures. This is interesting. I saw, Sandeep, in your slides, microservices was all one word. And I've seen other slides which have them as two words, and um, I don't know which one's correct. So maybe, uh, maybe someone can tell me which one's right. But anyway, so on with the, on with the show. Um, We've been building Weave Cloud now for about 18 months. Um, we started off using HTTP for internal traffic. And really, in the past kind of uh, nine months or so, we've migrated the majority of the internal traffic to gRPC. Um, so this is really a talk about my experience of that and, and, and what went wrong and what went right and, and how we did it and how we managed the migration. Um, of interest, everything here is we're actually running on Kubernetes as well, um, except for we run on AWS, uh, for now at least. So number one, my first experience uh, was about nine months ago, I was working on this project called Prometheus. Now, if anyone here has heard of Prometheus, Prometheus is to Kubernetes as Borgmon is to Borg. So internally within Google, there's this system called Borgmon, which is their monitoring system, which is used almost everywhere uh, inside Google. And outside Google, we have Prometheus. Prometheus is a fantastic monitoring system uh, developed by the chaps over at SoundCloud, although now it's uh, upstream in the CNCF, as is Kubernetes. And really, it's, in my opinion, the best monitoring system for Kubernetes. And so having used um, Prometheus quite a lot with Weave Cloud, we decided, hey, what we should really build is this big multi-tenant distributed Prometheus and, and sell it as a service as part of Weave Cloud. This is all open source on our GitHub. Uh, and really, we're trying to, you know, our business model, if you like, is to it's to sell the operational aspects and look after your data for you. Anyway, part of the challenge here, this slide is from a talk I gave at PromCon in Seattle. Um, part of the challenge here is getting data from your application into Weave Cloud. Um, you know, this is just an RPC challenge, so we thought, hey, why not use gRPC? Um, we, uh, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of experience with Stubby and we liked it, so we thought, you know, we really want to use proto buffers and gRPC, and we tried to build, uh, build this bridge using gRPC. Unfortunately, it didn't go that well. Um, 
part of getting the data into Weave Cloud means that your data has to traverse an ELB, has to traverse Nginx, and generally, you know, it has to go through the internet. And we pretty much, uh, you know, I think Sandeep touched it towards the end. Nine months ago, uh, gRPC wasn't very good at traversing systems that didn't support HTTP2. Uh, and Nginx and, and the ELBs didn't support HTTP2. So then we kind of got stuck on this and we ended up, I, I filed a bit of a contentious ticket that got a bit of attention, I'm afraid. And um, we ended up moving to a system where we uh, embedded Proto, still Proto 3, still Proto buffers, but we embedded them inside a HTTP uh, request and we sent them over HTTP 1. And that was the system we ended up, in, ended up with in the end. I uh, subsequently, at, at KubeCon in Seattle, I, I spoke to the TL for gRPC and he pointed me to this uh, issue which is the new gRPC web proposal. I believe there's a prototype out now. Um, and this actually would have solved the issue. Uh, it didn't exist at the time, um, but this, would al this allows gRPC to, uh, to traverse HTTP 1 and, and to use gRPC from the browser. As far as I know, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this bit. But that was kind of our, our first start with gRPC, and it was a bit of a full start. Um, I really like the gRPC fact that you you define your interface and it go, goes and generates code and all the stubs and, and you don't have to kind of write all the HTTP handlers yourself. So I was, really, I was really keen on it and I was just a little bit disappointed. So we kind of looked at the rest of the service. This is, this is actually the other half of the same slide. Um, if you look on, my, uh, on the slide share, you can see the full slide deck. We, we went and looked at the rest of Weave Cloud and we thought, where are our opportunities to use gRPC and where would it make sense? So uh, Weave Cloud is arranged in a microservice architecture. So there's lots, you know, I think last time I counted, there were 50 services inside Weave Cloud, which is big for a little startup, I guess. And we looked at all the different services um, and looked where we could use gRPC. Now, unfortunately, we've got this, this front end, as I touched on, this Nginx front end. You can't really use gRPC there, um, not just because it's Nginx, but because uh, we also didn't want to encode in the front end all of the different HTTP paths for all of our little services running in the back end. Um, so that was kind of a non-starter. You know, we don't want every time you change a service in the back end, we don't want to have to do a rolling upgrade at the front end. That would be that would be bad operationally. And we also looked at, you know, you know, maybe on a hope and a prayer, would does Amazon have any support or is there any bridges for gRPC to the back end storage services? This is kind of relevant to the chap who asked, can you run databases on Kubernetes? We kind of try and avoid running database on Kubernetes, and we use things like DynamoDB and S3. Anyway, the answer is no, there isn't. Uh, you have to talk to them using uh, the provided client libraries. But there is this opportunity between services inside Weave Cloud that talk to other services inside Weave Cloud. We, we started using gRPC. And this was kind of nice. It gave us the auto-generated uh, bindings, and it gave us a bit of a performance bump, so we like that, so that was good. The next challenge that we faced was monitoring gRPC. Um, we, as we discussed, we're big users of Prometheus and we're big believers in monitoring first. Bef you know, before you launch a service, it should have baked in monitoring and you should be developing your monitoring as part of your service. So when we went to launch these services, we had to figure out how to monitor the gRPC traffic as well. Well, we had our own set of HTTP middleware. So these are little functions that you inject into your HTTP um, MUX, your HTTP router, that will on the fly gather instrumentation, do logging, do authentication, these kind of things. So we developed a, a matching set of middleware for gRPC. And, and one of the really nice things about the implementation of gRPC is it supports middleware as a first-class citizen. In Go's HTTP, it, it kind of feels like it's a bit of an afterthought. But in, in gRPC, it's just like so much easier. If you look at this is the, I don't know, 23 lines of code it took to implement middleware, for, uh, the instrumentation middleware for gRPC. And if you go and look at the equivalent one for HTTP, it's like a few hundred lines of code. It's uh, a bit distasteful. Anyway, so we, we were quite happy with this. And one of the nice things about this middleware is it, it logs everything, it records everything in exactly the same way that we monitor HTTP services. And this gives us the nice uh, side effect that the, the dashboards that we build and the alerts that we build for our monitoring are identical between HTTP and gRPC. So this is really important to us as part of the migration path. So, so we did this, and, and what this dashboard is showing actually is this is Cortex, our uh, hosted multi-tenant version of Prometheus. You see the data coming in and trickling through these different services, and you can't tell from this dashboard 
which ones are going over gRPC and which ones are going over HTTP. We monitor exactly the same uh, request rates, error rates, and, and latency uh, distributions, whether they're gRPC or whether they're HTTP. I mean, we literally use the same format of metrics. And so this is kind of important for us. So this is nice. We like this. So the next problem, I wanted to come back and, and, and see if I could use gRPC to solve some of our other issues. In particular, I talked about how we didn't want to encode all of the routes for all of our different downstream services in our, uh, in our, our authenticating reverse proxy, our front end. So we came up with this method, and this is somewhat crazy, um, came up with this method called HTTP over gRPC. And so if anyone's been paying attention to Sandeep's talk, he mentioned that gRPC itself is just proto buffers over HTTP2. So I'm now basically putting HTTP inside a proto buff inside HTTP again. And everyone thinks I'm crazy, but it turns out this, this is a really nice idea, well, from my point of view. The front end takes the HTTP request off the wire that comes from our client. It parses the HTTP request using Go's standard HTTP server. It then constructs a generic gRPC request and sends that over gRPC to our back end. And in our back end, it, it dismantles this, reconstructs a, a quasi HTTP request, and then processes it through the normal uh, HTTP routing logic that lives in each backend. So this is nice. This means the front end's completely generic. This also means we get all of the advantages of gRPC's client-side libraries for load balancing, for service discovery, for all of the nice support and middleware that gRPC has that HTTP is kind of lacking. Um, it's interesting if we, uh, actually, yeah, why not? I'm going to bring up the definition for, um, for the, for the GR, uh, HTTP over gRPC. Uh, it's on GitHub, it's in our common library. And I'll just show you that it, it basically looks exactly like the HTTP request type in Golang. So here we go, HTTP over gRPC. And then it's this, I'm probably gonna make it a little bit bigger for you guys. No, nope, that's my settings. So here we go. We can see basically this is the, uh, this is the type definition for, apparently I'm appearing in 10 minutes on this meetup. Anyway, this is the type definition. Google Calendar. Sorry about this. So this is the type definition, the interface definition for HTTP over gRPC. And you can see that we define our downstream services, implement a single method. And this is actually implemented in this library um, that basically says handle a HTTP request. The HTTP request looks a lot like a, a normal HTTP request. It has a method, a URL, which well, should be a path really, a set of headers and a body. And similarly, there's a response. But one of the uh, one of the side effects of uh, of doing it like this was that not only was our transition to basically making all of our traffic gRPC pretty seamless, we just had to change a few flags, but also we got a really nice performance bump. Um, let's show you this. So this is uh, when I deployed it to production. The little peak is when we deployed it, and then you see the latency that I'm measuring go down. So this is measured on the client side. I'm measuring 50th percentile latency here because for some reason we had a few outliers. 50th percentile is kind of, uh, gives us a nice graph at least. Um, and we can see it dropped from just over 50 to just under 40. So we've got like a 15 millisecond improvement in our latency. So why is that? Well, one of the side effects of using Go's HTTP client internally on Kubernetes with the kube proxy and, and the way it manages requests is that we weren't getting very good load balancing. So what we've done to improve our load balancing is we've turned off persistent HTTP connections. So this has kind of made each individual request a lot more expensive, but made the load balancing a lot better in general. With, G with HTTP over gRPC and GRP gRPC in general, we don't have to do any of that. gRPC uh, integrates with this thing called Kube Resolver, which means we bypass Kubernetes DNS, we bypass the Kube proxy, and we do client-side native gRPC load balancing. So we get perfect load balancing, we get gRPC gives you persistent connections. We also get this improved request serialization and deserialization because it's being, they're being sent as protobufs, which I really hope is better than uh, HTTP. So yeah, so that's kind of, um, that was quite a nice result, HTTP over gRPC. Hopefully people don't think I'm crazy anymore. Um, and so finally, like point number five, the last example of, of, of where we've got to, and this really takes us up to date because this change got rolled out to production this week. Um, Cortex is made up of a collection of what I call ingesters. And these are the things that take samples and batch them up and write them out. 
And so they have a big batch of samples in memory. And if I want to do a rolling upgrade, like Sandeep showed you, if I want to do a rolling upgrade of all my ingesters, the upgrade scheme I used was to just have them flush everything that was pending out to S3 and the persistent storage. This was slow and this was expensive. You know, a full flush of all the data for a single ingester would take 10 minutes. And it was also really error prone. If anything went wrong, everything would explode and we'd lose data. That's not a good idea. So one of the, one of the, the changes I've just made is to use gRPC streaming so that when you turn off an ingester, or when you do a rolling upgrade, you're turning off an ingester and bringing up a new one, they find each other using our service discovery, create a gRPC stream between the two of them, and then stream all of the in-memory data between them. And this went from taking 10, 10 minutes to do, a, to do a shutdown of a single ingester to taking 14 seconds, which I think is pretty good. Um, so this, is, this has really changed how easy it is for us to do rolling upgrades for Cortex. And all the knock-on effects that had, you know, if we wanted to uh, turn off a computer, or if we wanted to do a kernel upgrade, all of these things used to require this big wait for the ingesters to flush, and now they don't. And GRP streaming, GRPC streaming was so easy to use because I didn't have to write any of that marshalling code. I just basically said in my GRPC config, I just said stream. And then GRPC went off and auto-generated all of the code I needed to make that happen. It was really impressive. So yeah, that kind of is the five learnings we've had so far from GRPC and our experience of using gRPC at Weaveworks. There's a whole bunch of other stuff I could go into. We've got a blog which covers a lot of this stuff in a lot more detail. Uh, one of the things, for anyone who's particularly interested, I would go and check out something called GoGo Protobuf. And this is a much more efficient, much more optimized, and much more code-generated version of the Pro Protobuf library um, that has made a huge performance difference for us. We've migrated everything to GoGo Protobuf. We've turned on all the optimizations. We've added a couple of our own to minimize the amount of copying we've done. And we, we, we managed to get the tail latency for one of our calls down from 100 milliseconds to 25, which I just think is absolutely fantastic. There's a blog post coming out about that soon. Anyway, I would be remiss if I didn't say we're hiring in these three locations. Apparently, I have to say this. So yeah, come and work with me if, if you dare. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Tom. That was fantastic. Um, are there any questions from anybody? Um, and yes, I know um, there are some blog posts shared. So if we can't get the um, link the second, we will make sure we follow up in the emails with uh, some of the blog posts that Tom mentioned. Uh, and Sandeep, I know you're still here. I'm not sure if you were um, able to listen to all of it, but I'm also curious whether you had any thoughts with what we've done here at Weaveworks. All I'm going to say is tunneling HTTP through gRPC. I saw that blog post and I was like, this is, this is, we've gone full circle. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a, as a fellow Googler, I think that will probably um, ring some bells with uh, some internal stuff. But, yeah, <laughs> when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. But it turns, it turns out it works quite well, so, yep. you know. Cool. Oh, I alluded to a couple of blog posts in there during that uh, during that talk. So I think there's a link to the turtles all the way down HTTP yes. GRPC yep. blog post. In fact, R Russ did share that, so thank you, Russ, for that. Um, but um, Javon was um, looking for. I guess you mentioned a few others, so we'll try. Yeah, to I don't, I'm just looking. I don't think the other ones have been published yet, but they should be coming out over the next couple of weeks. Oh, I see. Okay, I wasn't um, sure. I'm just checking our blog. <laughs> So no, the long tail one is not out yet. Sorry about okay. that. Awesome. I'll give everybody 10 more seconds of si awkward silence if you have any last questions that you'd like to ask. Otherwise, um, oh, thank you so much. Oh, what is the alternate to protobuf? Oh, yes, go, go, protobuf. Uh, it's go, a weird go, 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 proto. Here you go. Let me give you a link. I don't know, I don't know where this comes from or who, who's done it, um, but it's, it's well written and super useful. Um, and we've switched everything in Cortex over to GoGo Protobuf and saw a large uh, performance improvement. Um, basically, we one of the things with the Prometheus data model is it contains a lot of small strings, and Go uh, the Go garbage collector doesn't like that. Basically, so with GoGo Protobuf, we were able to eliminate all the copies for all these small strings, and this gave us uh, you know a couple of order of magnitude improvement in tail latency. So and there's a there's a blog post coming out. Is all I can say. Watch this space. Awesome. 
Okay. So with that, um, I'll thank both Sandeep and Tom for your amazing talks. Thank you so much. And thanks for everybody who joined uh, with your fantastic questions and comments. So um, thank you. Thank keep you. stay tuned for, in fact, I should mention, um, Sandeep is from Google and we will also have another dev advocate from Google in the next coming weeks. Um, Carter Morgan will be joining and talking more about um, other Kubernetes to topics. So, um, if you're already, if you haven't joined the Weave user group yet, in fact, that prompts me to share my slides. Oops, not these slides, but these slides. So if you haven't uh, joined our user group, if you found out about us through something else, please join one of our user groups. If you go to meetup.com slash pro slash Weave, we have uh, many cities, uh, San Jose, uh, sorry, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, New York, Berlin and London for now, um, but um, you know a lot of these are online, so you can join us there. And if you have questions for us on Slack, uh, you can join our Slack channel. So thank you again, and uh, thanks again to our speakers, and join us next time.